Yeah. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Roger Gibbons. I'm a member of the Harps and Middlesex Committee, uh, and I'm also a member of the Committee of Butterfly Conservation uh, European Butterflies Group. Um, this talk could be very much um, a meander through some of my travels uh, last year through uh, some of the most deserted and unspoilt regions of, uh, of southern France, uh, looking at um, the scenery, the butterflies and the flowers of the region. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm fortunate enough to spend, I spend a couple of months in uh, in Provence every year. And uh, in July, I spend uh, three weeks uh, traveling either in the Alps or the Pyrenees. Uh, and in 2023, it was the, the Pyrenees and the and the Cévennes that I was traveling through, um, where there are <clears throat> many uh, endemic high altitude species. Um, sometimes when I'm in philosophical mood, I think, uh, what is the appeal of doing these trips? Uh, and I think it really falls into three areas. One is just being in the locations, um, high altitude, very scenic, uh, and it's empty. Huge parts of France are completely empty and untouched by uh, human activity. Uh, I'm actually required to carry a, um, a mobile phone in case I fall and break an ankle. Um, <clears throat> The sort of second element really is to see large numbers of many different species and at high altitude, the numbers of butterflies don't seem to have dropped in the sort of 20 or 30 years I've been going to these places. They've stayed pretty constant. And the third element really is to see these uh, uh, rare and endemic and iconic species and also to, to photograph them. But um, <clears throat> starting the journey before we even get to France, uh, a trip to... Um, uh, one of my favourite places uh, near Ivanhoe Beacon uh, in May for the uh, early season species, Duke of Burgundy, Grizzled Skipper, uh, Dingy Skipper, Green Hair Street, which is, uh, which is always a delight. And the beauty of this particular location is that you can see all of these species uh, from tracks without stepping into, uh, stepping off the tracks. Um, what I've done on the, in some of these uh, slides is to show the route of where we are, so you get an idea of um, where um, where we've got to on the journey. We've basically uh, gone through Eurotunnel, through Coquel, and uh, we're now uh, taking a day to get halfway down France to uh, a place called Vierzon, which you can probably see on the map there. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a spot uh, very rich in, uh, in different species, and... Uh, for me, it's a place that um, I remember about 30 years ago uh, going to and seeing quite a lot of checkered skippers near Vierzon. And uh, so last year we thought it would be a good idea to see if we could find the same place again and uh, uh, without any particular record. But I thought I could remember where it was. And uh, it uh, luckily we managed to find it. And it's one of these areas where you've got all of these flowery tracks leading into woodland and they were, and they were particularly rich. <clears throat> And the good news was the checkered skippers were still there in good numbers, uh, which was uh, always very pleasing. Um, below that, we have uh, dingy skipper. And um, it seems to me that when you see dingy skippers in the UK, they're all very, very similar in terms of their appearance. But in France, they seem to be able to vary enormously. Um, and I rather like this fresh one, this sort of uh, dark brown sort of charcoal grey um, male sitting on the end of a stem here, which is obviously very fresh. And um, top right is a small pearl bordered protruderie, uh, which I actually saw when I came back uh, through the at uh, at the end of July. And bottom right is uh, a wall, female wall. <clears throat> is that a dark bear? In yeah, the big dot. Um, <clears throat> When wandering around um, uh, the area around Vierzon, I wandered into um, uh, down the track, which uh, was pretty deserted, and uh, I encountered this beautiful swallowtail. I, I once described a swallowtail as, uh, when I did a tour for Green Wings quite a few years ago, as the ordinary swallowtail to differentiate it from the scarce swallowtail. And I was given a severe rebuke from a lady who said, there's no such thing as an ordinary swallowtail, and she's right. Um, this uh, female swallowtail, as you can see on the right here, laying eggs on um, a species which I think is probably either hog's fennel or closely related. Uh, and I spent an hour just in the company of this uh, swallowtail uh, as it was nectaring and laying eggs. It was uh, really quite a magical hour. 
Um, second day, we head down from Viers on to, uh, to the Eastern Pyrenees. We're now in uh, the department of Ode, um, and I can't actually show the location because the, uh, the place that um, I was told about for the particular iconic species, Spanish Petruri, uh, I was swear, sworn to secrecy, so I can't show where that is. But uh, that was the target species for, for this location. Um, <clears throat> and um, here we have the two, two key species. On the left, uh, the marsh petruri. That probably doesn't look like a marsh petruri to, uh, to English eyes. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, of the subspecies uh, beckery, uh, which is very red orange, as you can see from the upper side, and probably even more strikingly from the underside. Marsh petruri is a very strange species. Um, it's certainly not uh, limited to marshes. There are very high altitude forms, and I think there are about uh, five or six uh, different named subspecies of marsh petruri. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the key iconic species on the right is uh, Spanish petruri, which is becoming really quite, uh, quite scarce in, uh, in France. It's a little more common on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees, but... Um, uh, and it looks remarkably similar to, to Beccary, so they're quite difficult to tell apart in flight. But uh, one of the problems with Spanish petruri is there are still collectors in France. And um, one of the famous locations, which we'll come to in a moment, is a place called Sornia, in the, uh, not far away in the Pyrenees Oriental. Uh, and um, it seems to have disappeared from that location, and it's suspected that somebody collected all of the eggs and it may now be extinct in that spot. So how many spots the Spanish petroleum still flies in on the uh, French side of the Pyrenees is, is really anybody's guess. Um, a few other, a couple of other species that I saw at this location. One top left here is the green underside blue, which I always think is quite appealing with these uh, black edges, uh, especially at the, uh, the apex. And um, top right is... Um, uh, a burnet. I've got quite into burnets. The French uh, lepidopterists are very keen on burnets. They're not very keen on uh, Pyrgus grizzled skippers, but uh, burnets certainly rate higher than uh, than grizzled skippers with them. And um, there's, um, I think there's probably about 30 different species in France. Many of them are localised. Uh, <clears throat> not many of them have English names. This one's actually called a billowing burnet, but... Um, I'm not quite sure uh, how it actually managed to get that name, but um, it's a species of Southern Europe and um, uh, it's, uh, it, it favours sort of dry, sunny regions <clears throat> and the caterpillars use crown vetch. Um, bottom left, I've included a few flowers from, from various uh, uh, travels. Bottom left is the iconic martagon lily with these beautiful bell-shaped uh, flowers. And it's, it's quite a tall flower, so you rarely miss it when you see it. And it's um, it has such iconic status that it's protected wherever it grows, not only in national parks, um, but wherever. You're not allowed to cut it, collect it, or disturb it in any way. And uh, bottom right, although this is not one I saw in the Pyrenees, um, uh, this, uh, this gets my award for the... Uh, uh, the, the most determined uh, flower I've ever seen. This is Glacier Buttercup. And I saw this in the Col de la Bonnette, uh, which is altitude of over 2,700 meters, uh, allegedly the highest road pass in Europe. Um, and um, that's uh, roughly twice as high as Ben Nevis, where the summers are limited to about three weeks. So how it actually uh, pollinates and survives there is, uh, is a mystery, but it, it gets my award. Um, next, we move a little bit to the east, to this uh, place I've mentioned, Sornia. Um, <clears throat> and um, I've shown here a sort of a Google Earth view, which is about the best way I can give you a, an indication of um, what it looks like. <clears throat> um, I do have a fly in. This is a track that leads from the road at the bottom up. And you can see the track, and there's two branches to the track, but the right-hand branch leads to a disused quarry. And disused quarries always seem to be incredibly rich uh, places. Uh, and Sornia is a, is a pretty rich place uh, in itself. I think I've seen close on about 80 species on this track. Um, <clears throat> and these are some of the interesting species there. Um, 
top left is the mountain small white. Uh, there are spe three sort of small white species, the, the small white that we're familiar with. Uh, there's also the southern small white. Uh, and this is the particularly rare and highly localized one, mountain small white, which flies at an altitude of about a thousand meters or so. It's not particularly mountainous. Um, but it is becoming very, very scarce and probably disappeared from many of its haunts, may well become extinct. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the way you can tell the difference is it doesn't have a black spot in the discal area in the forewing. So it is instantly recognizable. Um, below that, we have a, a mating pair of Chapman's Blues, very similar to common blues. Um, the Chapman's Blue, the way you can tell the difference if you can see the forewing is that uh, the Chapman's Blue doesn't have a, a spot in the discal area, <clears throat> but um, when it's uh, uh, wings closed like this, this is the way to tell to identify it is because the, the black marks in those white areas are pretty central within those white areas and don't touch the orange, which is uh, what uh, the black marks in common blue do. So, And that seems to be a pretty consistent way of actually differentiating them. Um, top right, we have uh, the beautiful Spanish gatekeeper. This is a female, and like the whites, there are three species of gatekeeper in France. The gatekeeper, I won't call it ordinary, uh, the southern gatekeeper, and the Spanish gatekeeper, which is basically an Iberian species which spills over to um, <clears throat> southwestern uh, parts of south central France. And bottom, I just thought I'd include this. This is a male lull with skipper, which was also seen in that quarry area, just to uh, uh, illustrate the fact that uh, not all the Lulworth skippers are near to Lulworth. Um, <clears throat> We're moving east now to uh, an area called, a place called Roquebrune, which is uh, Roquebrune sur Argent, which is uh, where we spend a couple of months in the um, uh, in May and June. And um, these are some of the species from, from that region. And this one um, is the magnificent two-tailed pasha, uh, misnamed butterfly, because you can see it's got four tails. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely huge species, about six inch wingspan, uh, fully opened, and it's the uh, only European member of the um, the tropical Caraxes uh, genus, which occurs in Europe. But um, we attract them with a mixture of um, rum and banana, which we mash the uh, uh, rum into banana so it doesn't evaporate, and, uh, and that attracts the, um, the, the pashas. They can detect alcohol from a distance of about uh, 20 metres. Uh, which is something they have in common with our neighbours. Um, but this one, as you can see, is uh, enjoying feasting on uh, dog's droppings here. But uh, there's no shortage of dog's droppings, and uh, I'm not complaining. Um, the interesting, one interesting uh, fact about two-tailed pasha is that um, the, the larval host plant is a uh, strawberry tree, uh, Arbutus unido, uh, and it shares with, with only one other species, uh, which is far removed from Pasha, and that's the Chapman's green hair streak, which is about the size and the, the uh, and the colouring of uh, the familiar green hair streak. So whether those two caterpillars coexist on the same bush uh, would be quite interesting. Um, some more species now from the um, region around uh, Rockabrun, which is in Var. That's very roughly in the same sort of position as Sussex is in the UK, if you can transpose the maps. Um, top left, we have the Lang short-tailed blue, um, which has this very interesting uh, unside pattern, which almost makes you feel like you might be drunk if you're looking at it. Um, it's a rather strange pattern. It's a highly migratory species as well for such a small butterfly. And um, it's not particularly short tailed, as you can probably see the length of the tails there. Uh, top right, uh, the iconic Provence hair streak, which is a species everybody wants to see when they come down to Provence. Um, it's, uh, it's really quite scarce and localized and um, collectors are a problem. So we keep the, the, the locations pretty secret. Um, but it looks like it's a species which is a cross between a green hair streak and a small copper. Um, from the uh, hind wing and the fore wing, but in fact is not related to either of them. Um, bottom left is the huge caterpillar. You might get some idea of the size 
from that photograph of the giant peacock moth, um, which is um, a, a moth that is uh, very similar to a uh, female emperor moth, uh, but probably about 50% larger. And um, bottom right is uh, brown argus, uh, particularly appealing with this full set of orange lunules, because uh, to be honest, I don't uh, differentiate between species that you find in France and the ones that you find in the UK. Um, a few flowers from the region and the, the area of, of southern Provence, especially in the spring, the, uh, the, the, the flowers are incredible, the incredible variety of, of different flowers and the number of them is just amazing. Sometimes you see these fields and they're absolutely um, awash with uh, a whole assortment of different colours. Uh, top left is the um, uh, violet limador, uh, which is said to be uncommon, although I find it um, from time to time, and it's a species of Southern Europe. Um, below that, we have the, the giant orchid um, with the magnificent name of Hymantoglossum rubertianum, uh, and that is a giant orchid. You can't miss it if it's in a field anywhere. Um, but um, this is also a, um, a Mediterranean species, but I'm vague feeling that it's actually been recorded in England somewhere, but whether that was um, wind assisted or an accidental introduction, I don't know. Maybe somebody in the audience knows. Um, top right is a very small flower, um, a small flowered catchfly, uh, which I think is rather appealing with this sort of uh, purple on a white background. Um, and this is also a, a Southern European species. It's quite common in Vaal. And uh, below that, uh, another very small flower, uh, spotted rock rose, um, which is also a Mediterranean species, but uh, it's, I think it's quite appealing with these little black marks on the, making a sort of little circle and the yellow petals. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other uh, interesting things uh, in the region of Var. Um, this is a Spanish moon moth uh, and it's absolutely huge. In, in Imperial, it's about nine inch wingspan and uh, it's called a Spanish moon moth, but uh, the French called it Isabella. And uh, uh, it's one of these uh, species that you see on posters in sort of conservation areas, um, but you don't see it in the wild. Um, <clears throat> so you're more likely to see it on posters. But um, by pure coincidence, we bumped into some Dutch friends of ours in a supermarket, uh, and um, they said that they were going to the Alps Maritime later that night with the uh, French expert on Isabella, who was going to take some female pheromones and uh, to determine whether Isabella flew in that region. And um, I have to say, I said yes, before even thinking that a two hour drive across mountain roads in the dead of night wasn't a terribly clever idea. But um, anyway, we got there and he had these uh, pheromones on, on cards, pinned them to trees when he thought the uh, wind was in the right direction. And amazingly, within about 10 minutes, we had about 10 or 12 males fluttering around. And this one landed on the tree. And um, I was quite pleased with the fact that I could even get a photograph in the dark um, using flash and uh, my wife putting a, a mobile phone uh, torch on it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, another uh, highlight in the world of moths is this oleander hawk moth. Um, again, the, these uh, Dutch friends of ours who live not too far away were given a caterpillar on oleander, which they bred. And uh, when it hatched, um, we got the call to come over. Of course, it sat on uh, <clears throat> an oleander <clears throat> in the daylight and was very easy to photograph. But uh, it's surprising that given that most of the south of France is um, uh, carpeted in oleander, the oleander hawk moth is really quite scarce. But I have to say, this is, uh, well, I, I find words, uh, I can't find words to describe the, the beautiful intricacy. I think this is the most uh, incredibly breathtaking uh, creature I've ever seen uh, in any part of the animal world. It's absolutely incredible. The, the strange thing about it is that um, if you look at either side of the thorax, it looks like that's where its eyes are. Um, but of course, these are not eyes. The eyes are at the head end. So maybe to some extent that uh, functions as a, um, uh, a defense mechanism. Um, 
a little wander around now the area uh, in um, in Var, not far away from from where we are at Rockabroon. Um, this is a, um, a little town called Cabas, and um, it's it's good for um, species like uh, Spanish purple hair streak, which I'll come to in a second. Um, <clears throat> But what we do is uh, to make it a little bit more palatable for my wife as we go there, we spend about an hour in the in the location, then go to this uh, uh, lakeside cafe for lunch. Um, uh, and then we re return to the location. But one of the things that struck us, because we've been doing this for about um, 15 years or more, is that the water level on the lake, this particular lake, you can always get an idea of it from, from what you can see there, that lake is dropping and it's dropped by probably about half a meter over 15 years. And this is a very worrying development uh, that uh, the rivers and the lakes are becoming very dry. Um, and this is the track that leads uh, riverside because the uh, Spanish Purple Hair Street likes ash trees, uh, narrow leaved ash, I think, uh, I think that's um, Fraxinus and Angustifolia. Um, and it's always near water. And this is the, as you can see from the sign there, this is the river Isol, very appropriately named river, but uh, very worrying. Again, over the last um, 15, 18 years, <clears throat> this has dried up and is now actually in the summer months, it has no water in it at all. So what impact that's ultimately going to have on the local wildlife is, uh, is frankly rather worrying. Uh, these are some of the species that you see there, some of the interesting species. Top left is the Spanish purple hair streak, which does extend, obviously it's Iberian, but it extends uh, southwest France into south central France. Um, <clears throat> very similar to the purple hair streak from the upper side, but with this uh, rather different pattern on the underside, which I think is quite appealing with this uh, silver stripe and orange stripe on the uh, on the margins there. Um, below that, we have the, um, the iconic nettle tree butterfly, um, rather uncharitably uh, called snout butterflies. Um, it's the only member of this, um, uh, the Libethea genus uh, in Europe. And um, it's named because uh, its caterpillars use uh, nettle tree. Uh, and that's often a, an ornamental tree in, in town centres. So <clears throat> quite often see it in town centres. Um, Top right is um, one of the satyrium uh, genus of, of hair streaks, uh, Ilex hair streak, which is quite widespread across um, uh, France, north and south of France. Um, it's, uh, there are a number of these uh, species, uh, satyrium species in France. We have two in Britain, obviously, white letter and uh, black hair streak. And you can see it's not actually that different from um, white letter hair streak in terms of the markings. Um, and this uh, too uh, uses um, oak, uh, I think uh, downy oak principally. And um, bottom right, just to illustrate that some of the species you find in France, the ones that we're familiar with can look rather different. Um, this is the, um, this is a, a female, it's the southern form of meadow brown, uh, the, the form Hispula, or it might be a subspecies, with these enlarged uh, orange patches on the, on the forewing. Um, we're starting the journey uh, west now towards the Pyrenees, and, um, and if you can see from the map there that uh, we're going west again, and we've reached the little town of Dion in the department of Gard. Um, this is the uh, the river Gardon, which, as you can see, like many French rivers in this region, are not in too much of a hurry. They're quite uh, quite shallow and very slow, and um, this is a very good location for the. Um, uh, Iberian marbled white, uh, which is a close relative of the marble white that uh, that we're familiar with. There are four species of marbled white in um, uh, in southern France, uh, and uh, most of them are basically Iberian species, which have rather spilled over into uh, into France. And this is uh, Dion is about the most easterly location for the Iberian marbled white. <clears throat> Um, and this is the Iberian marbled white top left. It does look quite similar to the marbled white uh, that we're familiar with, which is uh, uh, top right, a female marbled white. Um, marbled white is incredibly common in France. And sometimes you see them and you almost think you can count them in thousands. Um, 
And uh, there, there are two forms that you tend to get in southern France. Uh, the very dark form, bottom left, uh, Procida, and there are actually darker forms which are almost completely black. And um, bottom right is the form that I think does occur in Britain, is the, the white form, Luca Miles. Um, but this is, uh, it seems to me, much more common in, in France, these uh, <clears throat> uh, Luca Miles. And this is a particularly good example with almost no markings and almost completely white uh, hindwing uh, underside. It has to be said that I, there's Iberian marbled white, uh, there's Western marbled white, and there's also Spanish marbled white. And these names are really quite similar, but um, Spanish marbled white doesn't fly in France. But uh, Iberian and uh, Western uh, fly together quite often. Um, we're moving uh, west now. I think I may have a fly in to show where we are. Yes, a little yellow circle. We're, we've gone west now. We're into the Pyrenees, right on the Spanish border, right next to, you can probably just see Andorra at the bottom there. This is just past the road that turns off to Andorra. So it's a pretty quiet uh, area because most of the traffic that's going in this direction has gone off to Andorra. But this is the Col de Puymeron. Um, we're back in the uh, Pyrenees Oriental. And uh, what I've tried to do with some of these um, uh, scenery photographs is just to give you an idea of this sort of emptiness uh, and the, the fact that these areas are completely untouched. But this is uh, at 1920 metres at the Col, and there's a track leading off here that, um, that is actually quite rich in terms of uh, the variety of species that you get. Um, and this is another view of the, the, the coal itself, the car park at the coal. And um, uh, I've taken many of these photos from uh, Google Street View. Uh, but incredibly, this white building that uh, we've been there many times, we've never actually seen the white building and have any sort of activity at all being open. But somebody's taken it upon themselves to put on there in big letters, fight fascist scum. And a picture of what looks like a cat with some very fierce whiskers. Well, I have to tell you, I did look for some fascist scum to fight, but sadly I couldn't find any. But um, much as I love France, I have to say, you do get quite a few of these things and you have to say this could only happen in France. But so the cold between we're on from here, as you can see, there are tracks leading off in all directions. So uh, it's good for a, a whole day uh, wandering around. And... Um, these are some of the uh, species that you see there. Um, at the top uh, left and top right, the bright-eyed ringlet. Uh, and it's called bright-eyed because it has these um, ocelli with, with white centers, white pupils. Um, there are about uh, 30, 35 species of Erebia in France. And um, some of them have um, uh, ocelli that, uh, that don't have centers that are effectively blind. Uh, the, the, but uh, not all of the bright-eyed ringlets have these uh, bright um, ocelli. Uh, some of them are actually quite blind. But it's probably better illustrated by the photo top right with the, um, the bright um, pupiled ocelli on the hind wing and this mating pair top right. Um, bottom left, again, just to illustrate the difference between species that we're familiar with in, um, in, uh, in England, in the UK, and those you get in France, this is a uh, speckled wood believe it or not, uh, and it's, it's a female, and um, it's a, uh, the speckled wood in southern France is actually the nominate form of um, Igeria, whereas the, uh, the, the form that we get in uh, northern France, northern Europe, and in the UK is actually the subspecies Tiersis. And I've included here another um, burnet, it's called a discrete burnet, uh, Zagina nevidensis. Um, again, I don't understand what's discreet about it any more than I understood what was billowing about the other one. But this is a, a localized uh, burnet um, at um, at Puymeron, and um, the um, uh, larval host plant is uh, Tufted Vetch uh, Vicar Cracker. Um, moving. West now, have I got a fly in to show where this is? I have another little yellow circle. Um, <clears throat> we're moving further west now to the Nauve um, region. Uh, I think it's probably a national park. Uh, 
further west, again, all, all very close to the Spanish border, there are very few roads that actually cross the Pyrenees from France into, uh, into Spain. Uh, and that's because the, basically the Pyrenees are, are virtually impassable in, in nearly all of the areas. But this is um, a road that goes up to Novier and it stops dead. It, it doesn't lead anywhere. And this is a view pretty much from, from the top. There is a, um, uh, a huge barrage, a dam uh, at the top. And uh, this is looking down onto a lake, uh, the Lac d'Oradon, um, which is actually quite popular with, um, with randonneurs. And there's a car park there, and that's where basically most people go. Um, <clears throat> and this is another view. This is a track This is off the same road, looking in the other direction up to the Estoran, um, which is a very rich area for interesting Arabias, which, as you probably gathered by now, are uh, a primary focus of my trip. You can probably just see that there's a track that leads left-hand side up this damp gully. But um, this is where the, the target species, the iconic species, of, um, uh, well, top right here, the false Dewey ringlet. Uh, this rather tatty individual uh, <clears throat> was about the best photo I could take uh, last year. Uh, and it's it's very limited to certain areas of um, the Spanish border, and it's becoming quite scarce. But um, it's an early season butterfly, and I have to say, by the time I get there, most of them uh, are looking like uh, they're well past their best. Um, on the subject of other Erebia that you see there, because it is a very good location for quite a few different species of Erebia, is the, the Pyrenees brassy ringlet, top left, uh, Erebia rondui. Um, and it's sort of, uh, the camera's pretty much caught the sort of green um, brassy tinge on the forewing there of the uh, brassy ringlet. And uh, the good thing about brassy ringlets is that there are, um, I think there are four different species of brassy ringlet that, that fly in France. But the good news is that apparently no two species ever fly together. So there's never too much of an ID problem. And um, bottom left is probably one of the most appealing of the um, uh, French Arabia species, the, the Gavani ringlet. Uh, Gavani being a, a small town, quite a popular tourist destination um, on the just the French side of the, uh, the France-Spain border. <clears throat> and it does fly very much in that region. And um, bottom right, uh, can never resist, including the beautiful Queen of Spain, Futurri. Uh, you do tend to see them in an awful lot of locations, uh, and it's always a pleasure to see them. Uh, <clears throat> and this one looks quite fresh with the uh, almost complete margins, uh, virtually untouched, the fringes rather. <clears throat> and, um, other species that uh, uh, is quite uh, common, quite widespread in this region is the, the mountain ringlet. Obviously, we do have the mountain ringlet in, in Britain. We may not have it in England for too much longer, courtesy of global warming, um, but it's not uncommon in on the continent. There are a lot of different subspecies. Um, the alpine subspecies is Etheria, and the um, uh, Pyrenees subspecies is Favoy, and that's an eight letter word of which six are vowels, and the last four letters are E A U I. Quite how you pronounce this, I don't know. Uh, if anybody's better at pronouncing French names, I'll be uh, very pleased to hear from you. But this is a very gravid female, and in fact, it's the same female that was in the mating pair below, where they uh, subsequently, after they subsequently separated. And uh, top right, is a um, Lefebvre's ringlet, um, which I saw actually a couple of years ago. I haven't seen, I did see one last year, but this is uh, probably a more uh, indicative photo, which is really quite um, uh, iconic, different to most other Arabia because it's pretty much completely black and it has these large ocelli, uh, quite often with these large white uh, pupils. But this was seen in a location where they hadn't been seen for at least uh, 20 years. Um, moving on now, in just in the region of Gavani, <clears throat> uh, this is in this is a photo of the Osu Valley, the little river Osu here, and it's a road that is probably about mm, maybe eight ten kilometres long. It leads up to a barrage, and that's the absolute dead end, alongside the the river Osu. 
uh, and obviously the road was constructed for access to the barrage, not so that people can go and see butterflies. Um, but for the um, most part of the road up until about this point, it's a, it's a reasonable road. Two cars can just about pass, but after that it becomes quite a stony road and I'm not actually um, risked damaging the car tyres by going further. But as you can see, there's a, well, there is a bridge just out of this shot and there's a track on the other side that uh, you can walk along so you can see everything from tracks, particularly rich area. I've seen about 80 different species here. Um, <clears throat> and um, part of the, uh, the local um, uh, fauna is, uh, bottom right, is a, a marmot. I think I put some water on a rock here and um, obviously it was a very dry day and it came down to uh, lick the water off the rock. Didn't seem to be uh, too concerned about my presence. Um, the, the Ossie Valley is about 1,600 metres, so you get quite good altitude species here. Um, top left, one of the more interesting species here is the yellow spotted ringlet of the subspecies uh, Constans, which is uh, unusual for almost any species in, in so far as it's completely devoid of any markings, both on the upper side and on the underside. Um, the, um, the nominate form, which occurs in the Alps, does have quite clear yellow markings, um, but um, it's something of a puzzle how this could actually be a subspecies and be so completely different. And one imagines in time, maybe they'll separate to the point where they're considered to be a separate species. Um, below the very beautiful and iconic Camberwell Beauty, which uh, you do see from time to time in the Pyrenees, and uh, this is the sort of best view I've ever had with a camera. And this was the old film camera back in the early 2000s. And I've never had an opportunity to photograph one with the uh, digital camera since. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also at um, the Osso Valley, there's a little puddling area here. And in this shot, there are some 10 or 11 false heath protuberies uh, all dotted around. They always seem to be rather gregarious wherever species are puddling, they all tend to stick together. And there's a few blues in this um, shot as well. Uh, Damon blues, I think there's probably Chalk Hill and uh, Esther's blue, and um, probably a couple of Pyrgus in there as well. Um, yes, in the region of Gavani, um, have I got a fly in? Yes, I have, another little technical yellow circle that shows where we are now. We're a little further down. This is the Cirque de Tremouze. Um, and this is just to illustrate the, the incredible scenery of this part of the world. You can see it's very popular. There's a car park here, very popular with randonneurs. This is the end of the road and there are tracks that lead. But obviously it's clearly, it's a huge semicircle of rock um, <clears throat> and uh, completely impassable. But um, it's, uh, it's up at about 2000 meters. I've never found it particularly rich for, for butterflies, but um, it's uh, the, the scenery is absolutely uh, breathtaking. I did put um, Cirque de Tremouse into um, uh, some notes I was doing uh, for this talk, and the spell checker tried to change it to the Cirque de Dormouse. So uh, I'm not sure that artificial intelligence is actually scoring a hit on that one. Um, again, in this area, just inland from uh, from Gavani, there is this um, spot called the Barrage des Gloriettes, and it's quite a popular spot with, with tourists. On the left, we have a shot from up high, uh, looking down on the lake. Um, <clears throat> and on the right is a, a shot of the track that leads around the, um, the this artificial lake. And you can see the barrage at the end. There's a car park just the other side. And you walk across the, the walkway um, and then the, the track goes all around the lake. But there are certain iconic species here, uh, which makes it worth this walk. Because you can see it is slightly precarious. And if you were to slip off the, um, the track, and I have to say, carrying a, um, a camera, a tripod, a rucksack uh, and binoculars, you do have to make sure that you keep your footing. Because as you can see, if you slip down there, there wouldn't be anything to actually stop you hitting the lake. And um, the lake is quite deep. But um, <clears throat> the, this is on the left here is the Gavani blue, which is uh, the iconic species that uh, is, the, is the target here. Um, and I first saw that a couple of years ago. 
Uh, I was rather pleased to see it then. This is one I took from uh, from last year. Um, I was rather pleased to see Cavani Blue because uh, Andrew Middleton, who many of you will know, went on a, uh, a trip to the Pyrenees uh, quite a few years ago now. And uh, he always found it quite amusing that uh, he'd seen Cavani Blues and that's a species I'd never seen. Um, well, I've caught up with him now. But um, there were several Gavani Blues uh, puddling on the mud alongside the, the river, only in a, a very particular area. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, beautiful silvery blue upper side and the underside is below. Uh, and the other species that's very similar to it is the Glandon Blue, uh, which is principally an alpine species, but it does fly in the Pyrenees as well. And um, the upper side is such different. The upper side of Glandon Blue is very variable from a sort of light silvery blue to this sort of quite dark slate blue with a marginal pattern. Um, and the underside is below. And in fact, um, this underside was taken at exactly the same location as the Gavani Blue. But you can tell the difference between the two in that the Gavani Blue has these white patches uh, with no black spots inside and Glandon Blue can Blend and blue does. <clears throat> um, paddling is always um, rather in intriguing. Um, this is top, on the left here. We have um, uh, marble skippers. A marble skipper is uh, generally a, um, a lowland uh, species, but we're up to about 16, 1700 meters here at the barrage. And um, normally when you see um marble skippers they're they're in ones and twos uh and uh i have to say here i think i counted about 50 in a 20 meter stretch and there's a photo here of what uh, maybe 11 or 12 all puddling together as i say when they're puddling they do seem to be incredibly gregarious and on the right just a small subsection of uh, puddling blues um there are uh, various places i've seen particularly in the alps groups with with several hundred blues together so i don't know how many are here maybe 70 80 but you can see there um probably chalk hill blue uh glandon blue mazarine damon blue um and it's not uncommon to see uh seven or eight different types of blues all puddling together <clears throat> and uh i'll include this i might have shown this before in a previous talk but uh Hopefully you'll have forgotten. Um, this was also seen at Gloriette. Uh, and this is a, a female large blue. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it looked like it was freshly emerged. And it's very kindly sitting on an iris, which makes it even more photogenic. And uh, I think it was probably just emerged because it just seemed to be opening up. And it looks remarkably fresh. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I was able to get a shot of both the underside and the upper side. Uh, particularly dark markings here because um, this is an altitude effect and this is um, I think the form for a large blue is known as uh, obscura with these particularly heavy markings um, but this might be um, intermediary between nominate uh, and obscura but uh, always a joy to see large blues um, we're moving on here, as you can see from the map, we're moving north and east now to um, to, to the uh, to the Cévennes. <clears throat> we're now in the department of Lozère, and this just shows the, the sort of scenery. This is the Tarn Gorge, um, and uh, obviously millions upon millions of years to, uh, to carve out this gorge. <clears throat> but uh, this is a shot from up above as you drop down. You can uh, hopefully just see the, the, the way the road is snaking down in a series of hairpin bends. <clears throat> but uh, this gives you an idea of, if you can see in the distance, that it is completely deserted, devoid of any human activity. And um, this is another shot <clears throat> from uh, further up the road. Uh, and you can just see the, the town of La Malene at the bottom and the road snaking down. And uh, like many of these mountain roads, which are not particularly wide, um, they have helpfully here put some uh, some little stones to uh, to stop you going over the edge, which is uh, very helpful. And um, these are some of the species. The uh, Siven is very good, especially in uh, late July and uh, and August for satyrid species. And um, 
top left here is a grayling, which is actually quite common in this region. And I, and I suspect this is a, a female from the sort of general coloring, coloring of the, the post-discal area and also the, uh, the shape of the discal line. And um, below that, uh, a close cousin, the woodland grayling, which is probably about 25% um, larger than the grayling. And um, this is a pair engaged in, in courtship. Uh, and this looks like a very fresh female with, with wings open. And um, I suspect with the male behind uh, in attendance, and I, sus I suspect, and I'm not an expert on these things, that the female is showing acceptance because there's no raised uh, abdomen. And I'm pretty sure that was the case because uh, this courtship went on for, for quite a while and then they flew off uh, into, the, into the vegetation, presumably to, uh, to couple. Uh, and on the right, um, Dusky Heath, uh, which is uh, one of nine species of the uh, Cenonympha um, genus in France. Uh, this one adapted uh, top right to uh, the far south of France in the hot climate and this is fairly normal form, but in the Cévennes, you have this uh, slightly different form with the much reduced uh, ocelli, microthalma, um, as I say, much reduced ocelli and a much more orangey colour. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we move on here to, um, to the, uh, in the Cévennes, now more in the, centrally in the Cévennes, still in Lozère, uh, we're at the Col de Finiel, and it has to be, Lozère is one of the most uninhabited, uh, most sparsely inhabited areas of France. Uh, so most of it is an absolute delight to, to wander through. Um, <clears throat> you can see the track leading ahead, and this leads for literally kilometres through the woods and open area. Uh, it's uh, completely untouched. I've got a couple of slides to follow, which show you the sort of incredible um, sparsity of part of this uh, this, this sort of terrain. But this is particularly good for um, the uh, Ottoman brassy ringlet, uh, which was my sort of reason for visiting here. I've seen it here on quite a few occasions. And um, it's a species that um, uh, only occurs in France, in the region of mont Lozère, which we're not too far away from. Uh, one small, very small area in Northern Italy and then in the Balkans. So I'm suspecting that it was named as Ottoman when uh, the Balkans were under um, Ottoman control. <clears throat> and uh, this is it. Uh, uh, it might not be very exciting to you, but it's caused quite a, a ripple of excitement for me. On the left, we have a male which opened up in a um, brief spell of uh, weak sun. Uh, this was taken a few years ago. And the one on the right is the female, again, catching this rather brassy sheen, a uh, heavily gravid female. And I have to say, for a butterfly that's highly localised, it was very pleasing to see that they were actually flying in hundreds right across this area. So uh, it does seem to be surviving remarkably well. Um, and then on to one of my favourite places in all the world, the Lac de Charpal in Lozère. And you can see the lake in the middle. And you can see a network of uh, tracks through wooded areas all around. And this little yellow arrow I put at the bottom indicates uh, 1,500 metres, uh, one and a half kilometres, to give you an idea of the scale. And um, it's very untouched. You can spend all day there in some of the more deserted parts without seeing any other humans. And frankly, I can say from personal experience, it's very easy to get lost there as well. Um, <clears throat> because uh, my sat nav doesn't help me to get out of there. But um, there's a little spot around the left-hand side of the lake there where the barrage is, and that's where people go, uh, and they don't tend to move very far from there. They go to picnic and uh, enjoy the walk along the, uh, the top of the dam. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the species at uh, the back to Charpal and Col de Finiel. Um, top left is uh, Weaver's Fritillary, um, and I have a confession to make on this, is that um, it was actually at the Col de Finiel, and uh, I thought this was a female small pearl bordered fritillary. And it might look quite heavily marked, but uh, in these altitude uh, locations in damp areas, they are much more heavily marked than we're used to uh, in, in England. Um, 
and also because I've seen small pearl boarded for certain there on every previous trip. Um, that's probably about uh, six or seven trips going back over 20 years or so. Uh, <clears throat> so I didn't really give it a thought and labelled it as uh, small pearl boarded. Uh, plus the fact that when I looked at the distribution maps uh, of Languedoc, the region languedoc Roussillon, uh, there's no records of Weaver's Protrudery there at all. But I have to say, it didn't occur to me it was until somebody said, uh, that looks remarkably like a Weaver's Protrudery. And uh, I'd say, well, yes, it does. But <clears throat> it was in a place where Weaver's Protrudery doesn't fly, not even remotely near. Um, and um, I was, to be honest, I'm sure. And I asked two French local experts uh, and I said, what do you think this is? And they both came back and said, it's a female small pearl boarded. So I thought, mm, OK, um, always trust the local experts. But um, some sharp eyed person pointed out that if you can see here, you can just see enough of the angularity of that hind wing. And that says 100 percent weaver's patrillery, not small pearl boarded. So um, that was a lesson to me. Don't assume uh, what a particular species is just because of where you've seen it. Uh, <clears throat> sadly, true lesson. Um, top right, also from the same location, the very appealing <clears throat> Titanius fraternary, um, also a female, and um, a very, very appealing little black and white checkered uh, margins there. But uh, Titanius fraternary is another fraternary you get widespread across uh, southern France, and it is also extremely variable. Um, and bottom two shots are, um, bottom left is uh, a mating pair of purple shot copper. Uh, this has two forms. The um, nominate form Alcifon has the uh, ex uh, purple sheen across the pretty much the entirety of the, uh, the wings. This is the um, uh, subspecies Gordius, which has a limited amount of sort of purple uh, flush, uh, especially along the uh, the forewing costa at the top of the forewing, you can see there. And bottom right is uh, is, a, is a male underside. <clears throat> um, next stop as we heading north here, as you can see from the map, um, heading back uh, sadly towards um, Eurotunnel. Um, stopping off at um, in the department of the Loire at um, a place called the Jasserie de Garnier. And um, this little yellow arrow here is a kilometre wide, which gives you an idea of the degree of desertedness. There is actually, you can probably see on the map, uh, an auberge, which is where people go and you can you can actually lunch there. But um, And then there's tracks all around for, for randonneurs. But um, the target species here was uh, cranberry futurri. And in this vastness of this area, uh, there was really only one small spot that was sort of the epicenter. And it was a spot where um, marsh sink foil was growing in a, in a damp dip, probably no more than 25 meters across. And uh, the only reason I found this is because um, I was taken there by a local French expert um, <clears throat> uh, who was very kindly acted as a guide, showed me exactly and my friend from Lyon showed me exactly where they were took us there <clears throat> and how to uh, access the the location without uh, you know walking through the fields and uh, this is the target species the um uh cranberry fritillary it's um uh not dissimilar to uh, pearl border the same um, genus uh, beloria um it's a species i've only ever seen once before uh and I was very lucky to see that um, in the Alps. But uh, here, there were probably um, 25 flying in this location. And they were flying in, in company with uh, small pearl bordered fritillary as well, which is also a, a rather damp loving species. But um, uh, the males were showing a little bit sign of wear and the females were more fresh. And this one, probably slightly less than fresh, but uh, still a delight to see it. And, um, always uh, good for uh, photographers is the uh, was with a mating pair and uh, I have to say I don't know if you can see that on this blade of grass um it um it, it was much taller and it was flopping over and into it was in the way of the two butterflies so it was snipped off and then they moved up towards the uh, top of this blade of grass but uh, still 
uh, possible to get the photograph. And I think it's rather appealing, the sort of sheer complexity of the, the underside design. Um, next, we move a little further north into the Auvergne, uh, into the department of the Cantal. And um, there's a spot here, uh, an area where around the, the Plom du Cantal, uh, where the Sudeten ringlet flies. And again, I say, uh, target of my um, trip was very much was some of the uh, more isolated and um, uh, iconic uh, Erebia species. So, um, sorry, there's not too many of, um, of Ian's magnificent um, uh, Andean species here. Um, but um, the Plom du Cantal, you can take the, the telecabine up to the top of the Plom there. You can see it at the top of the hill. That's at about 1800 metres. And that's where the sedate and ringlet and yellow spotted ringlet, mountain ringlet and other Erebia fly. Um, and I did manage to get there in 2015, but repeat trips in uh, 2019 and 2023, the telecabine was not uh, in service because of high winds. Uh, and I have to say that's probably wise. I wouldn't fancy being in that in high winds. Um, <clears throat> another spot which is very good for uh, all of these Arabia, not far away, is the Puy Marie. Um, very popular spot with... Um, uh, randonneurs, as you can see, I've managed to get quite a few cars into this picture, but you can probably just see the track and people walking up and you can reach the top. Um, it's a rise of about 160 metres. Uh, but uh, I have to say the one occasion I did it, I only got halfway up, but there were just too many interesting species. Uh, I never quite made it to the top. But uh, for those of you who are interested in rare Erebia, this is the Sudeten ringlet. Uh, and it only flies in this area, um, and it's the subspecies uh, Liranus uh, that um, that flies here near the town of Lirong, and uh, it, the nominate form flies in one area around the Col de Glandon in the in the Alps, and then nothing else until you get to the Sudeten area, which I think is uh, uh, part of uh, what is now Czechia. So presumably once all of these were, were connected, but um, I didn't get to see it this year. And these are still the best photos I've ever had of it. Um, well, we headed back to um, uh, England, but we do return uh, south for the month of September uh, in, uh, in VAR. And uh, September is still a very rich month for, for butterflies in this part of the world. Uh, in fact, I mean, you can say until November, even late November, there's still plenty of butterflies flying. But this is in the um, uh, the village of Mons. I've shown a, uh, a map there marked with the X that shows where, where Mons is on the map. And you can probably see Nice on the right. So that gives you an idea of um, the location. Um, it's about an hour inland. And... Um, this what I've shown here is the uh, uh, the the auberge, uh, the the uh, and you can see the terrace. You can probably just see the terrace there, which overhangs the hill. And uh, we've had lunch on that terrace quite a few times, and it is absolutely magnificent. Uh, my wife has to have some pleasures, and on a clear day, the view is so good you can actually see Corsica from there. <clears throat> uh, but it's a very rich area for for really quite a number of species. Um, and then um, another visit that we made was to uh, the, the region called Santa Bome. And um, this is uh, marked with a cross here. You can probably see Marseille just to the left of the cross. But um, uh, looking at that green area, it just shows you how wild and deserted and unbuilt up that whole area is, uh, even not far from Marseille. And this incredible thing here, this is the rock of Santa Bome, and this is a monastery built into the rock. There is a steep track that leads up to it, and quite a lot of people do park here and go up and look at it, um, the, the track, uh, to the track to the, to the monastery. <clears throat> but uh, why they wanted to build a monastery there is a mystery. And um, this is the hostelry on down the road, just uh, lower down, where you can actually stay, and uh, it's run by monks. And uh, we stayed there this year, which is quite an interesting experience. 
um, had uh, iconic pictures of all sorts of uh, saintly figures uh, dotted around everywhere. And uh, we, we had uh, dinner there as well. Three courses plus wine for 14 euros, and it was served by monks. I have to say that's not an experience I've had before, but uh, was actually quite delightful. And uh, finally, just a few of the species here, the rare iconic and localized species you see around Santa Bome is uh, the sage skipper, which looks like a Pyrgus grizzled skipper, but actually is a different genus, mainly an Iberian species. And below that, the rather localized southern marble skipper, um, which is uh, similar to mallow and marble skipper, but it's quite localized. Doesn't look very exciting though. And uh, top right is the female black satyr, satyr uh, rare occasion where I managed to get an open wing shot. And then below that, and finally, um, one of the 15 species of Pyrgus uh, grizzled skippers in France, uh, one of um, uh, southern France, uh, late summer specialist, the, the sink foil skipper, Pyrgus cc. And um, that um, concludes my journey. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Roger. That was a really fascinating talk and um, great to see so many people joining. I think we got up to 68 attendees during it, which is uh, excellent. And thanks to everyone from both Hearts and Middlesex and uh, European Butterflies Group that's um, joined us. Um, if um, if you're willing to take some questions, Roger, um, that would be great. Oh, okay. um, if, if people would like to ask a, rest, a question, then either put it in the chat or um, feel free to um, turn, your, turn your microphone on and, and ask it. Maybe, maybe as there's so many, you'll perhaps put your hands up to start with so I can, uh, I can choose you. Um, but um, while we're just getting ready for that, do, Roger, one of the questions we do get asked quite a lot is um, is about recording butterflies mm. that people see in France their holidays. I don't know if you if you'd like just to say a few words about that in um, in in summary as to how people should go about if they want to report their sightings. It's still very um, fragmented uh, in France. Uh, the the regions and the departments all tend to work rather individually. I don't think there is specifically a sort of national recording scheme um, uh, as we have in the UK, but um, in, in, there are various um, organisations like CEN, uh, Conservatoire d'Espace Naturel, which are in the Pyrenees, they're in um, uh, CEN, PACA, Provence, Alps, Côte d'Azur, um, and uh, they have, uh, especially CEN, PACA, is very good at uh, with records, the only thing I would say is that a number of these species are iconic and a target of collectors. And um, uh, the general feeling is to withhold locations of those um, uh, uh, species, which are not generally known because, um, uh, as I say, you can't be 100% sure that, uh, um, that uh, collectors won't uh, home in on it. So there are, there are, different regions um there's uh, rhone alps uh, and um they there are now atlases on uh, all sorts of different uh, regions all around france but they, they do tend to work independently or doing their recording one day they'll pull them all together i'm sure right thanks um <laughs> hillary hillary has asked is it very very hot when you're in france <laughs> uh, it varies enormously um uh, i showed pictures of the osu valley and um i was in the osu valley i spent a, a day there um meandering around i thought it feels rather hot today and uh i checked <laughs> the temperature the osu valley it was actually 40 degrees but you know if you if you spend a couple of months there you do acclimatize to the heat so it's not so much of a problem but um some days it was in uh seven or eight degrees and some day some days it's up to the mid 30s it varies enormously uh, rather you than me i think i'll be melting in those temperatures but, um um what while i think of it um there was a question earlier about whether you could still sign the petition for for the potter's crouch plantation uh which is our white admiral wood that's under threat and i've, I've put a link to the petition it is still open i've put that in the uh in the chat so anyone that would like that feel free to um, copy that down 
Um, it's um, I don't know if anyone else has got a question. I can't I can't see any hands. Um, but if you have got a question and want to unmute and ask it, then please please do. Uh, I've got one here. Did I see fairy blues anywhere? Um, was that Roger Kemp? I didn't see the the rest of the question. Um, oh, Roger said, did you see fairy blues anywhere which should be in these regions? I saw in late August a dollars dollars Montenegro, not on the maps. Has anyone else seen this blue? Um, well, you can see them at Santa Bohm late June and July, um, limited to certain areas. And you do see them in the uh, Seven, where it's um, uh, Dolus uh, subspecies Vitatus, which is a slightly paler color in the in the Seven. I have seen them at various places in, in the Seven. So the, yeah, you need to know where to look. And I have seen them, yes. Just before the next question, I'll just say hello to Roger Perkins. Um, who I can see there. Um, we had a coffee a couple of years ago in Rockabroon. So hello, Roger. <laughs> right. Um, well, I'm not seeing any other other questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions on the people want to ask. Not seeing any hands. No. Okay. Well, I guess in in that case, we'll um, say thanks very much to uh, to Roger. As we've said, the w the recording will be um, up tomorrow on the Hearts of Middlesex Butterfly Conservation YouTube channel, and um, I don't. I'll send it to um, maybe maybe we can share it with um, European Butterflies Group as well to go in a future mailing to members um, if you want to anyone to catch up on it but it's um if you if you want to get it tomorrow then then this it's hearts and middlesex butterfly conservation youtube is the um is the place to look there is um, a question oh can there you read it <laughs> um i did read it very briefly it appeared very briefly so tell me if i've got it right it said is france doing anything to stop collectors yes it's it's starting to happen um i i what I do, if I, I've only met a couple of collectors and um, I take, uh, I question them and I take photographs of them, I take photographs of their cars and I send them to um, the appropriate uh, uh, conservation body. One was in um, uh, Bourgogne, Franche Comte, and um, they took action against him. They found out who he was, they identified him and um, uh, presumably of curtailed his collecting activities and there was another um that um uh, a guy who came down from paris to collect uh in in southern france and i did the same with in saint packer they are taking much more active they're realizing if they don't move quickly many of these species will disappear so each of the regions is is actually becoming very active in in um chasing down collectors and taking action against them um, there's another question from Ken that said, can you recommend a field guide in French if necessary? Um, yes. so I, guess, I guess means in English if preferable. <laughs> <laughs> um, a field guide, to, to be honest, um, there's a field guide that uh, Tristan Lafranchi produced. Um, it, it was in French and in English. It's it, he actually subtitled it, which I will take exception to, where he said, identifying butterflies is easy. Um, <laughs> uh, if you hang on one second, I'll... Well, I think that was the one I bought when I first went to yeah. France, which must have been at least 20 years ago. That so it's, it's, the... Yes, that one. Yeah. It's also, is, that still, is that still the best one? Uh, it's still the best field guide. The the others tend to be um, hardback or um, uh, there are one or two field guides that have been brought out. But I would say that's probably the most uh, compact with regard to, uh, to to France. But actually, that covers the whole of Europe. But um, it's probably the most compact. Okay, I've got another question now from um, 
Adebisi, who's saying, when looking at diff difficult species, do you rely on photos? Um, well, I've been doing this for a long time, so I've got quite a lot of experience, and you can rely on a, how they fly, a, what what uh, what flowers or what plants they may be attracted to, because you get certain species which really never leave their um, uh, the the larval host plants. Uh, Amanda's blue is always very close to uh, tufted vetch, for instance. So you, there are a lot of these clues and a lot of clues as to how they fly. Some of them have sort of quite weak flight, um, but um, to be honest, you rely on what you know flies where uh, most of the time. But I do take photographs of everything because sometimes you can't tell and you do need a photograph. And uh, uh, often if it's Pyrgus, you need a photograph for upside and underside. Uh, and you basically um, can only really identify them when you've got to, you know, time to sort of look at books and study them. So, yes, for the most part, you can tell that some you do need to to photograph. It's always wise to photograph them, I think. Um, and Roger Perkins has said, great talk. I'm returning to VAR on the 16th, 24th of May. If you're also there, Roger, perhaps we can get together for half a day. Tristan's yeah. field guide is great. <laughs> yeah. Duly noted, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, you Right. OK. Well, lots of people saying thanks and uh, looking forward to getting to France. So, um, yeah, that, that was really great. And thanks. Thanks ever so much, Roger. Thanks to everybody that's um, that's turned up and listened right through to the end. And, um, yeah, we'll hope to uh, see you again sometime soon. Cheerio. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.